girl little more than a youth. I remember that day as though it were yesterday. Little did we realize that it would be a day that would go down in history. We were the new model non-conformist army. Presbyterians, Baptists, Independents, all were there. And later I learned that few but Mr. Cromwell believed that such an army would hold together. Yet hold we did, for we were all willing to serve wholeheartedly, and therein was our strength. Most of us were poor ignorant men, and our army was really untried except for a few scattered garrison soldiers who had been called in. At the last moment, Parliament saved itself by freeing Mr. Cromwell from the self-denying ordinance which forbade any member of the House to hold military office. Riding through the night from Ely, he arrived only just in time. Our Commander-in-Chief was Sir Thomas Fairfax. Major General Skippen commanded our foot soldiers whilst Mr. Cromwell was Lieutenant General of the Horse. Charles I wanted to revive and perpetuate the medieval idea that church and state were one and the people fit only to obey. The royalists called us the new noddle and were highly contemptuous of us, but I suppose we did look a ragged, motley crowd. However, Mr. Cromwell said, when I saw the enemy drawn up and my own company but poor ignorant men, I could but smile to think how God would, by things that are not, bring to naught things that are. He was in an ecstasy of faith. Charles Royalist Cavaliers had half our number, but his nephew, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, was in charge of his cavalry. It was Rupert who coined the name Old Ironsides for Mr. Cromwell. Seemingly innocent people spied on both sides. reserve of foot was held behind the centre. As God's my judge, the first sound heard was that of a hunting horn, and onto the field came the local hunt. One of our officers advised them to get away, lest harm or hurt come to them or their hounds. adopted the same formations as us and about 10 o'clock of the morning the royalist line, gay with colours, advanced upon us in the most gallant array. The forlorn hope fired a volley and the Battle of Naseby began. The battle started with a series of skirmishes. Then Rupert 
pulpit of the Rhine and his cavalry charged and broke through our right flank and continued on to attempt to plunder the baggage trains at our rear. By the time they had reformed with blown horses, it was too late to affect the course of the battle. centre broke under the first royalist attack and both sides reinforced their centres. With clubbed musket and push of pike the main central attack continued with separate smaller fights surrounding it. Deadlock resulted and all now depended upon Mr. Cromwell. He did not wait to be attacked but sent his best against the northern cavalry. The others he launched at the left flank of the Royal Infantry. began to retreat onto Broadmoor and, sensing victory, we advanced. The number of prisoners began to mount up and some of our men got carried away and went for the royalist women. tried to lead a small reserve of horse to help his stricken foot soldiers, but his bridle was seized, and someone gave the order, march to the right. pursued the royalists beyond Leicester. The king was arrested three days later at Holdenby House in Althorpe. The king's field army was broken beyond repair and our cause had triumphed. From the field, 
Mr. Cromwell wrote to the Speaker of the House of Commons, Honest men served you in this action. Sir, they are trusty. I beseech you in the name of God not to discourage them. He that ventures his life for the liberty of his country, I wish he trust God for the liberty of his conscience. Thus, on June the 14th, 1645 at Naseby, England embarked on the hazardous venture of permitting more than one religion in the state. In that travail of Naseby Field, modern England was born, and Oliver Cromwell must have known he had marched into history, never to be forgotten while time shall last.